boy, we got ourselves a weird one today, folks. One that tries to be both ridiculous and heartfelt at the same time. Seriously, I couldn't even think of a more interesting intro for this one, so let's just get started. The cover here is pretty frickin' epic, but also incredibly busy. There's a lot to digest here, from Sonic and Sally hanging over the edge of an icy cliff, and Sally in a position where her spine is contorted in such a way to show off her big fluffy tail, Ooh. to the robotic dog and SWAT bot standing over them, to Uncle Chuck being held hostage, to what appears to be a caveman charging forward with a giant rock above his head. It's a hell of a lot to shove into the front cover of a book, but at least it does get me interested in what the hell could be going on inside of it. And right away, we're pushed straight into the action with the Freedom Fighters on a snowy mountain being pursued by a group of SWAT bots. A stray shot from a bot's laser sends Sally falling to the ground, but she's quickly grabbed by Tails, and the group tumbles down the side of a mountain, hoping to escape when they're stopped by a second patrol, being led by a robotic canine. Sonic recognizes the dog as his dog, Mutsky. Bunny notes that he looks pretty damn hostile, but Sonic tries to break through to him and get him to remember who he is. While at first it looks like it's working, both he and the SWAT bot suddenly turn around and start heading off. Turns out Uncle Chuck was the one who sent them away, using some of the passcodes he knew from his time under Robotnik's control. He also warns Sonic that the dog could be pretty dangerous since he knows Sonic's scent so thoroughly, though Sonic is disbelieving. As the group is getting ready to retreat, and no, we don't get an explanation as to just what they were doing out here in the mountains, Antoine trips and ends up sliding into a giant ice block containing this guy. Uncle Chuck identifies it as a prehistoric Mobian bear, which Tails suggests calling Moby for short. While Sonic is apprehensive about doing anything with the frozen beast, Rotor is quick to state that he could potentially bring him back to life and cut to his workshop where he's doing just that, trying to slowly defrost the cave bear. When he says it could take several days before the process is finished, Sonic gets ready to head out, but accidentally knocks the melting laser, causing it to heat up and speed up the process. So why was Rotor worried about doing it this slowly? Anyway, the defrosted bear is, of course, totally fine, but completely out of his depth, and he does what most of us would probably do in this situation. He flips out, destroying the laser that was defrosting him, and then immediately leaping out of the window and attacking Sally. Before he can do any more damage, Bunny grabs him and sits him high up in a tree to both let him calm down, and so they can figure out what they want to do with him. Rotor is just about the only one who sees any potential for learning about the bear, but Bunny then decides that maybe they can communicate with him via artwork, and produces a crude drawing in an attempt to show that they're friendly but it only makes him think of his cave wife, cave dog, and cave son, and he runs off in the hopes of finding them back where they found him. Sonic reluctantly runs after him, after the others show a bit of concern of him getting captured, and he finds him completely surrounded by bots, in a distinctly not snowy quarry. I'd like to think that a cave beast that big would be able to handle himself in a fight, but hey, Sonic is the hero here. Sonic spins away the bots with a tornado, but accidentally knocks himself out on the wall of the cliff. Wow! You're an idiot! And of course, Mutsky happens to be there and starts to advance on the knocked out hedgehog. Moby notices this and swings in to save him, causing Mutsky to knock himself out on the cliff wall as well. Is everyone in this story just magnetized to stone walls or something? Sonic comes too just as Moby is about to crush Mutsky, but Sonic uses Bunny's artwork suggestion to convince him not to harm the robotic pooch and manages to get through to him, even apologizing for being so judgmental about the several thousand year old physically imposing and mentally underdeveloped death machine that he helped to revive. You know, the charming family friendly morals that we all like to see in comics. Cut back to Knothole, where Uncle Chuck has, somehow, managed to restore Mutsky's consciousness. So Sonic's got a robo-dog now, and he's going to be just as integral to the story as Bunny has been over the past 20 issues or so. And then cut to an unknown jungle that is so freaking unknown that not even Robotnik knows about it. I, uh, I'm pretty sure that jungles don't work that way and that a planet-ruling despot would probably notice something like that on his GPS, but I guess I'll take your word for it, Chuck. 
He brought them here to give Moby a place to stay that might be more comfortable for him, since it's totally uninhabitable to normal folks. I get the reasoning behind that, giving the cave bear a place to live that's closer to what he'd be used to, but you're really gonna throw another semi-sentient being into a hostile environment where his survival wouldn't be guaranteed? That's cold, man. That's real cold. And then we end on Moby saying goodbye to Sonic and Mutsky, who, when told to give Moby his paw, does so literally. <laughs> oh, the fun we have here. This story confuses me quite a bit. I like parts of it quite a lot, like Sonic meeting Mutsky again, the idea that Mutsky could be a very dangerous opponent due to the fact that he knows Sonic so well, and even the Moby plot here could have been interesting if a little Scooby-Doo-esque. Oh, and the fact that Bunny actually had a role in the story was a plus. But each of these potential positives were executed in an off fashion, shall we say. The Mutsky and Moby plots could have been fleshed out into a dramatic and comedic story of their own, respectively, but combining the two together makes the comic feel like it didn't have a very solid idea of what sort of story it wanted to tell. They do try their best to mash the two concepts together by bringing it around to having Moby display empathy for Mutsky near the end of the story, but that just raises even more plot points that aren't addressed in a satisfactory manner like Moby's family, which is brought up all of one time, and then he just completely forgets about them. And yeah, Bunny does get some much needed screen time at last, but aside from putting Moby in a tree, everything that she contributes to the story could have been filled in by basically any other character. In fact, her solution about trying to communicate via artwork with him was something that I would have expected Tails to come up with, all things told. I'm glad she's actually here, at the very least, and that she's doing something, but when Antoine's unique butt monkey status is more inherent and unique to the plot, in that he helps to kickstart it, it really highlights how hard they were trying to find something, anything, for her to do. One positive that I will give the story is Sonic's love and devotion for Mutsky. It's touching, and again, seeing Sonic show a range of genuine emotion is something that'll be missing from a lot of the later comics, and seeing it here is very nice. I won't really spend a lot of time talking about the art this time around because it's good, it's standard for what we've expected. Art Mawinney and Rich Kowalski do their usual real good job here, and I will say that I really like Robot Mutsky's design. It's just a cool looking robot dog, threatening but not to the point where it seems out of place when he regains his playful puppyish side near the end of the story. Moby less so, aside from the whole bear part, it's just a generic super tough caveman design. Moving on to the backup stories, we have our requisite two page knuckle story, this time with a distinct lack of knuckles in it. Instead, these two pages bring us back to the captured Chaotix, who are disoriented but at least unharmed. The mysterious Archimedes makes it clear that he knows who they are and what they're capable of, but that he doesn't want any sort of confrontation with them, even opening the door and promising them an explanation once Knuckles arrives. The small group of friends walk out and are led down a hall where they turn a corner and are met with the mysterious Archimedes. End until next month! As I've said before, this keeps the story moving forward and basically just exists to remind us that the Chaotix are indeed characters that we should care about. It does build up the mystery around Archimedes a bit more, but that's about it. Good old Ken not only wrote the script, which is far too wordy for the two pages that it lasts, but also once again does the pencils, and any sort of compliments I could give his artwork back in the last issue's main story has vanished, as we're once again back to the uncanny stuff, and just plain uncomfortable looking artwork that I normally associate with his style. And at this point, I'll just be happy when these two page stories are over and done with, and they actually start telling proper stories with these characters again. Well, I say that, but, uh... No, no, we're not there yet, one crisis at a time. And now we come to the story that I was really interested in, the continuation of the Rotor story from last time. After a brief recap of the last issue, we find Rotor on an ice floe, alive thanks to... Well, would you look at that, it's Celia! one of the Arctic Freedom Fighters from several issues ago. So okay, it looks like I was wrong, they do get another appearance early in the comic. Or rather, two of them do, as both she and Augustus the Polar Bear manage to save him from drowning while he's knocked out. 
Rotor takes a moment to explain the situation to the two of them, and they agree to help formulate a plan to try and liberate Rotor's family. And what do they come up with? A literal Trojan horse. Looks pretty good for a rush job, too. Robotnik is quick to realize that it's a decoy, but that comes a little late as Celia, Augustus, and Rotor leap out and easily destroy the ice bots before they have a chance to mount any sort of defense. However, Robotnik still has control of the other walruses and gives them an order to destroy Rotor, forcing them to retreat out onto the ice flow as the mob starts to advance on them. Augustus manages to trap them by breaking the ice flow in a few different places, basically stranding them on a big piece of ice, leaving them unable to complete their mission because apparently they don't have the ability to swim while under hypnosis or something. The tide catches their flow, pulling them out to sea, as Rotor tosses a tracer onto it so he can at least keep track of them. And so Rotor says goodbye to Celia and Augustus, who promise to keep an eye out for the drifting walruses, and give Rotor a working radio so they can keep in touch with him while he returns to Knothole to work on a means of breaking Robotnik's hypnotic hold on his family. Hope he comes up with something before they die of hunger, thirst, or exposure. This story, once again, is pretty good. There wasn't as much substance to this second part as there was in the first, as most of it was just spent establishing that yes, Celia and Augustus still exist, but it did have a rather downer ending, something that I didn't really expect to see when I first read it. It's made even sadder that, according to my incredibly sketchy memory of the early comic, this is a plot point that is never properly resolved at any point. It does have some good dialogue and runs at a decent pace, and once again the artwork is well done, so while it might not have been the ending I was expecting, I do think that it was a well done story and I was happy to see Rotor getting a good spotlight. So we close out our look at issue 32 and move on to issue 33. We've been pretty good so far about actually keeping to the main book, but we'll see how long that lasts, folks. I'll see you all next time.